Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Segretto, and once again, truly honored to be your moderator for tonight's In the Know Town Hall. We welcome all of you. Tonight, I have to tell you, I am so excited about tonight because we're going to focus on, without question, a revolutionary concept in medicine, something that almost seems in the realm of futuristic, science fiction, Star Trek-like. We're talking about the fascinating possibility of being able to successfully transplant an entire functional human eye. A milestone like this, when it happens, just think about this, could potentially restore sight to millions upon millions of people. But here's the challenge. The eye is only one of one of four organs that has never successfully been transplanted. The others are the brain, the spinal cord, and hearing apparatus. Now, while doctors have been able to transplant parts of the human eye, such as the cornea, the ability to implant a functioning eye from one person to another has yet to be done. It's an endeavor riddled with scientific and technical challenges that range from the surgical and medical aspects to the molecular and genetic intricacies of nerve regeneration. But our experts at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute have set their sights on making this happen in the next 10 to 15 years, maybe 20. But nonetheless, they are working on it. And quite frankly, it's nothing less than a scientific Everest. And as the nation's number one eye hospital and unquestioned leader in almost all ophthalmic advances, the team at Bascom Palmer is uniquely qualified to make this dream a reality. Wow. Now, we have put together Trust me, I mean, we talk about the Mount Rushmore of doctors when it comes to certain aspects of what we talk about here in the In the Nose. Well, this is the, the Mount Rushmore, an incredible panel tonight that will take us through this fascinating process step by step and what it will really take to make it happen. Now, mind you, again, we still have to wait 15, possibly 20 years. But the panel tonight is led by Dr. Eduardo Alfonso, the director of Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, chair of the Department of Ophthalmology of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, and Kathleen and Stanley J. Glazer, professor in ophthalmology at the Miller School of Medicine. He is world renowned for his expertise in eye diseases such as corneal surgery and ocular microbiology, as well as healthcare administration. He'll be joined by Dr. David C. Professor of Ophthalmology, Dr. Nasser Ibrahim Al Rashid, Chair in Ophthalmology, an ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery, and an expert in the clinical diseases affecting all the tissues around the eye. And Dr. Daniel Pelez, a research assistant professor of ophthalmology and an expert in tissue regeneration. See, it is truly truly a world-class group of experts. Now, before we get started, let's go over how you can participate in tonight's conversation. After Dr. Alfonso has delivered his opening remarks, all panelists will answer the questions that you've submitted over the last few days. But here's the other part. You have the opportunity to submit questions during this program live tonight. For those of you who have been with us before, you know the drill. For those of you who are new, or maybe some of you need a refresher course, all you need to do is look at that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and submit your question. A reminder to all of you, all of the questions will be submitted anonymously. Now we have a lot on our plate tonight, so we promise you we're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can. But we're going to kick it off with a friend of mine. We are honored to have him here. He is the, he is the straw that stirs the drink for Bascom Palmer, so to speak. Dr. Eduardo Alfonso. Dr. Alfonso, it is so great to see you. Thank you for making the time. This is such an amazing subject we're gonna be dealing with tonight. Well, thank you, Tony. And what a tee up, man. I, I'm gonna to have to hit that grand slam now that I told you last time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and I'm delighted to represent the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. It's an extraordinary group of physicians, researchers and staff that provide exceptional service to our patients. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. As part of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, we have provided care in South Florida for more than 60 years and have been ranked number one by US News and World Report by 20, for 20 years and about 18 of these consecutively. Our mission is always to improve sight, prevent blindness and advance ophthalmic knowledge through compassionate patient care and innovative research. Our physicians are skilled in every specialty 
meaning there's no eye disease we cannot treat. We attract patients from all around the world who seek our expertise. And our residency education program has been ranked the best in the United States for many years because we train the most skilled ophthalmologists of the future. It's really a shot at the moon, what you have described that we're gonna talk about uh, tonight. And it's truly groundbreaking technology to transplant a human eye. This is an audacious goal, but because we are the best in the country, I think we're gonna be able to achieve this. The eye being one of the most complex organs in the human body is difficult to transplant. If achieved, we, it would constitute an incredible feat in human health, the restoration of eyesight. One of the unique challenges is connecting the optic nerve, which contains the nerve cells responsible for transmitting visual information from the eye to the retina and connecting this to the brain. This is gonna be one of the big challenges we're gonna be talking about tonight. Despite uh, many impressive attempts, no one has been able to do this before and we plan uh, to be able to do it. The scientific discoveries needed to make this a reality would also have a huge impact on the treatment of many other diseases of the human body, such as spinal cord injury and Parkinson's disease, as well as many other eye diseases. For this to happen, it will take a multidisciplinary team of researchers, not just from the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, but from across the university, the Miami Transplant Institute, the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, the Department of Engineering, Neurological Sciences, and many more. This is a project that will require the best and the brightest minds. And fortunately, we have two of them here tonight. Dr. David C. will share the latest on the science of the eye and the tissues around it. And Dr. Daniel Pelais will share the newest experiments that have led to the steps necessary to transplant an eye. I hope that tonight they will be able to answer your questions. Tony, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. It promises to be a great evening. So let's turn our attention now to the questions submitted by some of you. And our first question, Dr. C, we welcome you this evening. We thank you so much for being here. The first question is for you. Is a human eye transplant possible? Well, Tony, uh, this is a very straightforward, yet very complex question. The success of recent face transplantation proved that impossible is possible and invoked the imagination of the scientific community. The whole eye transplantation uh, remains a, an unthinkable challenge. The project is a long and daunting scientific journey. Uh, the answer to your question may be no because of the biological barriers, but the value is in understanding the why and in finding solutions to overcome these barriers. We don't want to fail because of lack of efforts or failure of imagination. This is a massive neural engineering project. Uh, the success of the whole eye trans, uh, transplant endeavor will depend on the power of collaboration and multidisciplinary uh, team approach involving the entire scientific community. Uh, the expected outcome of this project is a demonstration that a transplanted eye um, um, can survive and achieve neural connectivity to see. And due to the advances in microsurgical techniques, and transplantation immunology and neuroscience, I, I firmly believe we will eventually reach that uh, aspiration. This is our shot at the moon uh, project at the Institute. Dr. C, thank you so much. Dr. Palais, welcome. We are excited to have you here with us tonight. Our second question is for you. Has a functional eye transplantation been accomplished in any other model system or a laboratory animal? And second part, where does this research stand as of tonight? Well, good evening, Tony. Thank you for moderating this. I'm excited to, to be here and talking about this uh, very aspirational project. So actually, yes, it has been accomplished and many people don't know this. Even people in the vision science community 
but functional light transplantations are possible in uh, other species that have regenerative capacities, such as the salamander, the frog, and the zebrafish, and even in young birds. So these were studies that were done back in the 1950s and 60s by two Nobel Prize winning neuroscientists. And unfortunately, what hindered the further development of this technology was that at the time, there was no way to study the whole genome of these animals. Next generation sequencing, with the advent of next generation sequencing, we can now do comparative biology because remarkably, the, the retinas and the visual system of these animals is very similar to the human eye, uh, both at the cellular context as well as the gene level. So now we, with uh, next generation sequencing, we're able to study comparatively why in mammals we don't achieve regeneration while in lower vertebrates, they're capable of reestablishing full vision. And Dr. C and I have made some, some important discoveries in that in terms of some genes that affect scar formation and healing that are present in mammals that are either mutated or deficient in these animals and whether gene therapy or pharmacological approaches will allow us to suppress these genes or modulate them and achieve mammalian recovery is one of the goals of the project. Thank you, Dr. Palaz. Dr. Alfonso, why do this research on transplanting the eye at Baskin Palmer? Tony, this is an audacious idea, like we said, uh, and uh, Baskin Palmer is a very audacious place where we have uh, scientists, clinicians, and staff that are really at the top of their game uh, when it comes to scientific knowledge and clinical practice. So uh, Baskin Palmer is perfectly uh, placed uh, in today's uh, scientific and clinical environment to be able to accomplish uh, the research that will be needed to transplant the human eye. And like Dr. David C. said earlier, uh, we feel strongly that we have such a strong understanding on uh, cataracts, it's pre their prevention and uh, surgery, glaucoma, the diagnosis and uh, treatment, macular degeneration and diabetic eye diseases that uh, we uh, have the understanding of some of the challenges which are these that I've just mentioned that can occur while transplanting an eye. I compare this to the NASA space program. Today, we use many of the technologies, technologies developed during the time of uh, placing a man on the moon uh, in today's world. So uh, I think we're gonna learn a lot of uh, science and clinical care out of this project of transplanting the human eye. And Baskin Palmer is the perfect place at the perfect time uh, to do this. Agreed. And, and so far reaching this research, it's so, so far reaching. Dr. Alfonso, thank you. Dr. C, uh, we heard Dr. Alfonso talk about the challenges. What are the real major challenges in this daunting scientific journey? And I, and I know there are many, but give us some of them. Well, the whole eye transplant idea is, is a new frontier in ophthalmology. And uh, before any scientific discovery journey, uh, there are the known challenges. And I'm sure that as we go along, we will encounter along the way uh, many unknowns and unknown unknowns. So, so far, what we know that is that there are four major known hurdles, ranging from technical difficulties to challenges unique in transplanting a part of the central nervous system. The main problem in transplanting an eye is the uh, uh, biological barriers to neural tissue regeneration to regain function. And as an orbital surgeon, uh, the first challenge is to explore the anatomical feasibility of vascular connectivity and tissue survival of a donor eye in the recipient orbit. Surgically, to connect artery to artery, vein to vein, and optic nerve to optic nerve, and then, and then the eye muscles eye muscles onto the donor eye. The second ch challenge is the physiological uh, challenge, ocular tissue survival. To maintain ocular tissue viability and function from the time of harvesting the eye to the time of transplantation, we need to explore elements of tissue media to optimize our retinal ganglion cell survival. Retinal ganglion cell would be the function of cells inside 
the eye for us to pick up uh, uh, images. Uh, oxygen perfusion uh, requirements and all these challenges require our medical uh, innovations to overcome anatomical limitations and provide adequate uh, sustenance to the, to the eye. Third is the immunological challenge, host versus graft, uh, because the body would like to reject any foreign tissue that is implanted. And then all graft versus a host kind of disease. So preventing rejection is a key element in uh, preventing uh, allograft injury and, um, and, and establish or maintain tissue function uh, after the eye um, as is transplanted. Then fourth and final challenge by far the, the most, uh, the greatest challenge to overcome is the optic nerve regeneration and connectivity. Um, the, the eventual neural functional connectivity, that means connecting the eye to the recipient eye and to uh, produce picture, um, uh, is not the main focus in this er early journey right now. We need to overcome the first challenge first before we can talk about and explore more of the subsequent three challenges. Thank you, Dr. C. I can see all of the challenges you have to overcome, and it's, it's remarkable that we're even at this point. It really, it really is. Dr. Palais, uh, multifaceted question here. Um, how can stem cell research play a role in learning how to transplant an eye? What are stem cells, and how are they being applied to eye diseases? Oh, well, thanks, Tony. That's a great question. Uh, so, as Dr. C just mentioned, one of the most daunting challenges and one of the central hurdles around this project is regeneration. And there's really no better platform to study regeneration or to help us understand regeneration than stem cells. So I'll go to the latter part of your question just to give you a brief explanation of what stem cells are. Everybody's heard of stem cells. Everybody knows that stem cells are these cells that are capable of regenerating different parts of the, of the, of the human body. Now, Think about this, your DNA is an instruction book. It's an instruction book uh, on how to build and maintain the human body. Every single cell in your body receives a full copy of this instruction book. So technically every single cell in your body could be able to generate a new eye or a new retina for you. Now, as we age and as cells uh, specialize, they actually start closing chapters in this book because they don't need them for what, what their special uh, specialization is. Stem cells are, are cells that are capable of ungluing these chapters back open, and they have access to the entire instruction book. So we can then actually instruct them into how to make new tissues, the tissues that we want. So very recently, the factors that are actually open up the chapters that make up the, the human retina, for example, were discovered. And right now I can take a patient's skin sample, create stem cells for them in the lab, and actually generate new retinal tissue. So these are human platforms for, for retina, where we can study development of disease, where we can study regeneration of some of the retinal neurons, where we can actually extract some cells for transplantation studies. So the limitation in the stem cell realm is not actually generating new retinal uh, neurons. It's actually right now we're working on ways to transplant them back into the eye and get them to reestablish function. Thank you, Dr. Palais. You know, Dr. Alfonso, we're going to go back to you. You, know, you, you um, sort of touched on this earlier um, in terms of what Baskin Palmer, why, why that Baskin Palmer is such in a great position to do this. But uh, how are we equipped to, to do this research? What is it that makes us special to do that? Tony, that's a, that's a great question. And uh... In the last, the answer to the last two questions, you start getting a flavor that, uh, you know, outstanding clinician scientists like Dr. C and Dr. Palais are a key component of being able to achieve this. And if you uh, consider that uh, Dr. C has uh, 50 colleagues like him who are clinicians, and Dr. Palais has another 25 colleagues like him who are scientists and all 75 of them are currently part of the full-time faculty of the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. In addition to about 800 full-time staff that help uh, these uh, clinicians and scientists do their work uh, every day, 
um, in an institute that has a brand name that attracts the best uh, students in the world to come and uh, work with us and ask all the right questions around this project. And also the fact that because of our brand name also, uh, institutes around the world want to partner with us to do this type of research. I think that we have not only the internal ability at Bascom Palmer and the University of Miami to get this project going, but we will be able to engage uh, partners uh, around the world to help us achieve this. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. And I would have to believe partners are critical in this, in this journey. And speaking of this journey, Dr. C, um, let's talk about the first steps that you've taken in this journey to transplant an eye. What are they? Well, I, just to add on what, uh, what Eddie has just uh, mentioned, is that uh, Bascom Palmer's um, identity is, is creativity. That's a creativity is the uh, cornerstone of Bascom Palmer's identity. We like to take on challenges because they are hard. And, and certainly eye transplant uh, project is indeed a hard um, uh, undertaking. So to answer your question about the steps that we have taken in our lab in this long journey is that we have taken many small steps at this time. And as an orbital surgeon, I had mentioned earlier, one of my main interests is the anatomical feasibility of uh, doing an eye transplant, harvesting a donor eye, and then putting into the re recipient orbit and allow it to survive. And then the connectivity will come uh, uh, later on. So the answer is that in our cadaveric dissections, we can say that we can surgically connect artery to artery, vein to vein, and optic nerve to optic nerve, and then eye muscles onto the donor eye. Uh, we can implement the, these con uh, connections. Um, the uh, major element of unknown is whether the donor eye will survive uh, in the recipient orbit that will require a perfusion of blood and, and that's where uh, artery connection will be very, very important. But more importantly, whether the optic nerve will, will regenerate and achieve eventual connectivity that's a million dollar question. The eye is the telev uh, is a television camera of the visual system. And the optic nerve is the television cable connecting the eye to the processing center in the back of the head. The whole eye transplant, transplant project is analogous to bringing a new television camera and connecting the cable to the existing cable to transmit signals to the control uh, center. Uh, so the, the connection is, is what's important. So the first thing we, look, we need to look at is the healing process between the interface of the connecting end of the optic nerve. One problem as with any healing tissue is the formation of a scar at the junction, preventing the growing nerve fibers or what we call axons from crossing the divide to align and connect to the, to the nerve fibers. And we are developing a compound to retard the scar formation at the interface and use drugs to promote the sprouting nerve fibers to advance toward the final destination. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for an unexplained reason, uh, these growing fibers will receive signals to turn around preventing it from reaching the final destination. And, and Dr. Palias and, and his team has developed a, a peptide that will inhibit this repulsive signal and allow the growing fibers, fibers to go the distance. So that's part of the, of the uh, discovery. Uh, you have a problem and try to solve it. And so when we see the, there are signals in preventing the fibers from progressing to the final destination. We find a solution to, to uh, prevent that. And this is part of the work that goes on in, in our lab. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And a great, a great uh, picture painting there of the, the cable and the, and, and the camera. Uh, Dr. Palais, um, how will the advancements made so far that we've just been hearing about uh, benefit other eye diseases? Oh, well, that's a great question. And I think Dr. C touched on it uh, a little bit. So one of the First things, for example, that we see when we when we injure the optic nerve uh, or when we cut into it is activation of these repulsive cues that are normally in development help us form or establish our view of the world. What's up, what's down, what's left and what's right. But these turn out to be very repulsive. So we've actually, in collaboration with medicinal chemistry, uh, started developing drugs to modulate these when we try and reconnect the optic nerve. Uh, to try and get these axons to regrow, like Dr. C said. However, in doing this exploration, for example, we discovered that this pathway is also activated in very early glaucoma, as well as Alzheimer's disease. So we have collaborators now in Miami Project, for example, that are using some of our compounds to see if they're, if they're amenable for treatment in Alzheimer's disease, and early Alzheimer's disease. Another thing that we're looking into is the formation of a gliotic scar, which is what Dr. C was alluding to, and we're developing compounds for that. And this, is, this comes right out of our studies in, do, in looking at regenerative competent species like the frog and the zebrafish, where they don't have those genes to form those scars. So we actually created compounds to try and stop that scar formation and allow regeneration to occur in the, in the, in the human system. And finally, with the, with the advent of what I just mentioned of, of us capable of generating new human retinal tissues in a dish in the laboratory. So we've come up with some discoveries with our ocular oncology team that actually elucidate how the pediatric tumor retinoblastoma comes about. So this was something that was uh, unachievable before because there's no animal models for retinoblastoma. And nobody's able to study these in humans because the formation of these tumors usually happens in the womb and these babies are born with this, with this, with this cancer. But with the advent of this platform in the laboratory, we've been able to find out why these tumors progress in some patients and why some don't. And we're developing some new therapies for that disease as well. Dr. Palais, thank you. Uh, Dr. Alfonso, you, you mentioned the importance of partnerships and because of Bascom's name and everything that we do at Bascom Palmer, it creates opportunities to create partnerships. With that in mind, what role does philanthropy play in treating blinding eye diseases? Thank you, Tony. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the main uh, uh, objectives that we have is to really create these partnerships that are so unique and have been shown in the past to be so fruitful. So an audacious project like this requires many, many pilot projects to be done. Uh, you've heard Dr. Palais, Dr. C explain all the intricacies of steps that need to be taken to, to, to find out how to reach all these uh, different uh, goals that are necessary in the path to the final goal of transplanting an eye. And uh, many of these pilot projects are not funded through regular funding sources like the federal government and uh, application of grants to the National Institute of Health, which is our primary funding source. So philanthropy plays a huge role in helping us uh, fund these pilot projects. And it's in partnering with our benefactors that gives us an incredible obligation to work and reach the goals that we have promised our philanthropists. So for every dollar uh, that we receive from the federal government, uh, it is also expected for Bascom Palmer to put in a dollar. So that dollar comes from our philanthropic uh, resources to fund uh, the cost of these projects. And if you look back at the many discoveries that have been made at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute that have markedly changed how we treat diseases of the eye from cataracts to diabetic retinopathy, to retinal detachments, to macular degeneration, all of those, all of those above have been made possible because of philanthropic dollars. So we've got to continue to play uh, a, a big part. Uh, philanthropy has to play a big part in making uh, our research happen. 
and especially for this project. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. Dr. C, we're gonna go back to the optic nerve. What is the experimental evidence that a severed optic nerve can reconnect to the brain? And has there been any success with regenerating the optic nerve so far? Well, Tony, before I answer that question, I just wanna add on what Eddie had just said and the importance of philanthropy. Um, and th there's an Arabic expression that just says, um, the heaviest baggage before a long journey is an empty wallet. And I think what we have accomplished in our lab um, uh, was due entirely to the generosity of a donor uh, who lost his eye at young age. And his hope is to have uh, a, don a, a, a transplanted eye. So that's the impetus for much of our research uh, in the lab. But what we have done so far cannot be possible were not for the generosity of this stoner. So to answer your question, um, um, Daniel's already commented on the salamander, the frog, and the zebra fish um, in transecting optic nerve, regenerating to regain function. In mammals, a little bit different. Uh, as a scientist in 1980, use a peripheral nerve uh, from the extremities uh, to restore connectivity of nerve bundles from the retina, from the eye to optic nerve. And his study showed that uh, axons, which are the fibers of the of nerve from the, from the uh, spinal cord uh, could regenerate for long distances within the peripheral nerve uh, system. Uh, graphs, but not back into the central nervous system. This proved that damaged uh, central nervous system nerve uh, tissue is inhibitory to axon regeneration, while peripheral nerve tissue uh, is uh, permissive. So the experiment sparked a research revival leading to the identification of many inhibitory molecules that Daniel spoke about that block the axonal growth in, the, in our central nervous system. And then recently in 2012, a scientist in Boston showed that retinal ganglion cells, these are cells with inside the eye, are able to regenerate axons, fibers, the full length of the visual pathway to make the first connection uh, to the first uh, switch to partially restore visual function in blind mice. So this is, these are very encouraging breakthroughs in neuroscience, uh, demonstrating the feasibility of reconstructing central circuitry for vision after optic nerve uh, damage in, um, in mammals. So we just need to continue the work and build upon the innovations and discoveries uh, um, that, have, that is in the literature so far. Dr. C, thank you. Dr. Palais, Dr. C has talked about this from, from his vantage point. So I'm going to come back to you now because I know you specialize in regeneration. Uh, what are some of the major hurdles remaining that prevent a whole eye transplant from being successful from your area? Sorry, I was muted. So yeah, I think Dr. C was right in highlighting that obviously the major hurdle is still optic nerve regeneration, central nervous system regeneration. And he talked about the differences between peripheral nerves and central nerves and how we've discovered or how we've, how we've come to figure out that some of these repulsive cues that come from the development aspect of the central nervous system are the ones that we need to modulate to achieve full regeneration. He also discussed uh, the, the reprogramming study. So what he mentioned in mice was, was a study that actually used some of these stem cell factors that I talked about that help reopen these instruction books on how to make a new eye. And when the scientists injected those factors into the eye, they got a youthful neuron to come out of it that was able to regenerate. So basically these neurons uh, suppress all of these repulsive cues to, to, to innervate the optic nerve and reach the brain. And one of the major challenges that we face right now is trying not to do this uh, in a genetic fashion because most of these things don't occur because of mutations. Most people that require an eye transplant uh, are due to other, uh, other conditions. 
So we are looking into the drug development space and drug development is a major challenge. We work with our medicinal chemistry uh, group as well as the National Cancer Institute to try and come up with new compounds that will help us modulate these pathways and achieve regeneration that way. Dr. Palais, thank you. Uh, Dr. Alfonso, this was just sent in to us. Can you explain a little more in detail the relationship between the eye implant and curing blindness due to macular degeneration? Meaning, will an eye implant be the solution or is it the technology? So the, uh, you know, in, in, in looking at how uh, macular degeneration takes place, which is a uh, degeneration of cells that we were born with, when we look at an eye transplantation, we're going to have to make sure that those cells that are in the eye that is being transplanted to a patient don't continue to degenerate at the pace that they were degenerating before. And this is one of the things that uh, Dr. Polais is investigating because we, ne we need to be able to control that. So what's gonna happen? That here we're gonna be in a laboratory doing experiments to see how we can keep this degeneration from happening in an eye that we're going to transplant. So that knowledge can be transferred to current diseases like macular degeneration. So we're gonna find ourselves discovering many ways to manage and treat diseases that we currently deal with today, like macular degeneration. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. So, so many, again, far reaching aspects of what we're talking about here, but uh, Dr. C, this may be the million dollar question. What kind of time frame? really are we talking about here? Is it anticipated? And how high are your expectations for ultimate success? Well, I don't have a time frame because it, this is a long journey requiring uh, lots, of, uh, lot, lots of resources. Uh, but I believe the greatness in medicine is not about the possible, but about the impossible. Uh, we need to believe in the impossible and remove the improbable through scientific discovery. And I think eventually we will get to the final destination. And that's a reason why uh, the Bascom Palmer is engaged in this project. Um, uh, I'll make the decision to try because it is hard. Um, while a transplanted eye gaining the ability to see is the desired outcome, uh, my interest is in, in the course of scientific, scientific discovery. We hope to identify and close critical knowledge gaps, overcome bottlenecks, finding missing pieces to the puzzle, and translating uh, scientific uh, discovery into clinical application for conditions, for conditions closer to home, like glaucoma, hereditary retinal diseases, and macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Um, scientific research is a dynamic field uh, where change is a constant and a major breakthrough is just an experiment or two away. Uh, we expect a spin-off discoveries to, to exert a major impact uh, in the field of medicine. And, and I have high expectations uh, in the collateral benefits of this uh, journey of discovery. This is so fascinating. Dr. C, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Palais, uh, we just had this sent to us. I lost vision in my left eye due to retinal detachment four times. Is there a procedure currently to replace a retina? Well, I mean, that's, that's a, a question more for the physicians in terms of what's available in the clinic right now. In terms of the scientific discoveries, now the, the people in, in our own lab are capable of generating new renal tissues. Clinical trials have started on the safety of transplanting either parts of the retina as well as the full thickness renal grafts uh, to replace at least parts of the retina. So there's ongoing clinical trials for the safety of transplanting new photoreceptors and RPE, which are the cells that are lost in macular degeneration. 
And in my own lab, we generate new renal ganglion cells, which are the cells that, uh, that form the optic nerve. And we are working on how to transplant those back for people that have lost uh, vision to diseases like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. So there, there is ongoing work. I, I'm not sure. I don't think there's any clinical application right now, but maybe Dr. C or Dr. Alfonso can field that question. Dr. Alfonso, Dr. C, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, so well, I think uh, that, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, we've learned quite a bit about uh, transplantation of other tissues in the eye. Um, and uh, we currently are able to transplant uh, other tissues in the eye. One of the ones, what I do, which is corneal transplantation, we've been very, very successful um, in being able to do this with a success rate of greater than 95% of being able to restore the vision that the eye is capable of with a corneal transplantation. So uh, we have gained a significant amount of experience in transplanting different parts of the eye. Uh, in terms of a retinal transplant, again, is that connection to the brain, which is what the retina has to do, that remains uh, a bit of a challenge. But uh, even this past week in one of our clinical conferences, uh, we discussed how a patient that we treated where, uh, that had a problem in the macula. And so they had to transplant retina from another part of the eye of the retina to the part of the retina that was diseased and how uh, the patient gained uh, vision in that uh, area that was damaged before. So this, this are exciting uh, research and clinical findings that we see ourselves uh, in the midst of today that will be applicable to transplanting an eye. Well, the, the, uh, retina, the okay. retina is like the photographic film inside of a camera. And there are many layers of that film. And in our lab, Daniel um, is uh, exploring uh, and successfully um, uh, exploring uh, the uh, implantation of growing of the retinal cells outside the body in, in tissue culture with the eventual aim of forming this layer of important uh, film that can be transplanted uh, onto the eye, inside the eye. So we're taking uh, small steps uh, with the ultimate aim of replacing the retina and if not, replacing the eye as in an eye transplant. So these are steps being explored uh, with the aim of regaining vision. And Dr. C, thank you. Dr. Alfonso, we're gonna go back to you. And uh, this was sent to us and it sort of piggybacks off of what Dr. C talked about a few minutes ago. And the question goes like this, will the advancements that will help a transplant eye, help cure all types of eye diseases that cause blindness. Now, I know you're gonna have other discoveries along the way, uh, but this question comes in, in a form of what he's talking about, maybe uh, retinoblastoma, retinal diseases, glaucoma, macular degeneration, eye trauma, you get it, eye inoculation, re retinal neurosis, all of these things, or necrosis, pardon me, um, that we're talking about here. Do you feel that that could be touched on this? Absolutely. And let me just give you a concrete example. So, you know, we have a natural lens inside the eye. That natural lens becomes cloudy with time as we age, and that's called a cataract. So if we're going to transplant an eye. How do we keep that natural lens from uh, decaying in the way it does because of aging and forming a cataract? Wouldn't it be great if in that phase of discovery, we discover a way to prevent the formation of cataracts, which we will. And so that's a, an example that I think all of us feel close to because we will all develop cataracts at one point or another, and many of us will need uh, cataract surgery. Likewise, glaucoma. Glaucoma is a disease that is partly due to the fact that the plumbing inside the eye becomes defective. The eye is not able to release the fluid that it has inside through its natural plumbing. And the pressure gets higher inside the eye like a balloon that's ready to explode. If we take a transplanted eye, we have to make sure that we learn 
how to keep this plumbing from getting clogged and having to call Rotor Rooter to fix it because this is part of what we're going to need to discover in order to be successful at transplanting an eye. So in that process, we're going to figure out how to fix the plumbing of the eye to prevent progression of glaucoma. Two of the most common diseases we deal with every day with patients. So just an example of what the spinoff is going to be in, uh, of, of doing this project. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. Dr. Palais, could stem cells one day make optic nerve transplants possible? So uh, that's one of our goals. In, in my lab, like Dr. C alluded to, we are generating the renal ganglion cells, which are the neurons that actually form the optic nerve. Uh, so that's not a challenge anymore. We can actually take a, a patient's skin biopsy, uh, reprogram their stem cells, and actually generate new renal ganglion cells in the lab. What we are working on right now is transplanting these back and guiding them through modulation of these repulsive cues for them to be able to actually form a new optic nerve. Uh, so that is the next major hurdle in that respect. Dr. Palais, thank you. Dr. Alfonso, this was just sent in to us. Uh, can good tissue be taken from the good eye and transplanted into the bad eye of the same person? Absolutely, Tony, and we do that today. Uh, so uh, many times, uh, and I have done it in corneal transplantation, uh, I have taken uh, a corneal tissue from a patient's left eye, which was blind from birth because of a optic nerve condition, but had a normal cornea, which is the structure in front of the eye, and I have taken that cornea and transplanted it to the right eye of the same patient that had the cornea injured by an accident. Uh, so we, that's the ideal transplant because the immune system of the patient is not going to try to reject that tissue because it knows that it's the patient's own tissue. Uh, so in uh, looking at the transplantation of an eye, we are going to utilize this concept of, that we call immune privilege, meaning that the tissue is privileged by our own body not to be rejected uh, in order to achieve many of the goals of transplanting an eye. Thank you, Dr. Alfonso. Dr. C, this was just sent to us as well. Can one reconnect a severed optic nerve in the autologous model? In the, well, uh, clinically, what we see is, is uh, injury to the optic nerve, like car accident, the forehead hitting the steering wheel, and then the patient uh, uh, walks away unable to see, blind, because of the crushing injury to, to the optic nerve. But the optic nerve is not cut. Uh, this is not analogous to an eye transplant in which you have to connect the cut ends of the, of the optic nerve. And our main focus in our lab is to attend to those uh, traumatic nerve injuries, uh, which we see. And, um, and, and what would be the, the uh, immediate 911 rescue modality? That's what we are trying to, to develop a, an immediate treatment to rescue the, the, optic, the injured uh, optic nerve. Uh, a, it's very rare to see a transected optic nerve clinically. It's very, very uncommon. Uh, but oftentimes it's just a crush squeezing injury uh, of, of the optic nerve where the wire is still intact, but it's not functioning. So there are different ways to try to salvage that scenario and to try to understand the molecular underpinnings of the initial injury and how to blunt those uh, tissue and molecular responses to save the, the optic nerve. This is the main focus of our uh, uh, lab that has translational value that we can take it from the bench to the bedside, hopefully soon. So, but to answer the question of transect the optic nerve, it's very, very uncommon clinically the only application is 
in eye transplant. Thank you, Dr. C. Dr. Alfonso, we talked about partnerships before. Uh, this is uh, no doubt going to require a multidisciplinary effort from many experts across the university. Can you share some of the expertise needed to make this a reality? Yeah, Tony, and, and uh, uh, we, we are in, in full partnership uh, with many of the other basic science and clinical departments at the Miller School of Medicine of the University of Miami. Uh, in addition to uh, many of the departments uh, with the rest of the university, for example, the Department of Engineering, the Department of Computational Sciences, uh, there is the need to uh, bring uh, not just uh, uh, vision scientists uh, that uh, work every day on uh, areas of the eye and vision, but uh, scientists that are outside uh, this, these areas that not only bring new knowledge, but are thinking outside the box. So we engage uh, the Department of Immunology, Cell Biology, Biochemistry, Physiology, and many other areas of the university. Uh, to achieve uh, this goal. And the beauty of it is that uh, we are all rowing in the same direction. So uh, we're gonna take this boat to the finish line. Hey, Dr. Alfonso, thank you. Dr. Palais, we just had this one sent in to us. How can we participate in the study to use stem cells to regenerate the optic nerve? Uh -huh. Well, great question. Uh, well, unfortunately, those studies are still in the preclinical phase, so they're still in animal experimentations. Like I said, in the lab, we're capable of generating these neurons, even human neurons, uh, but we are still working in the animals and looking at the different iterations of how a transplant might look and what, what's going to make it effective. So there's, there's really no trial right now. Thank you, Dr. Palaz. Dr. Uh, Dr. C, we just had this one sent in to us. Uh, would someone with a prosthetic eye qualify? Uh, well, it depends on the nature of the original injury and why a, a, a prosthesis uh, was in a place at the beginning. I think would be a, from, from a neuroscience perspective, I think connecting the, the donor eye to an injured optic nerve uh, from previous injury, um, that would be difficult because the, the donor, the wires from the donor optic nerve will have difficulty in connecting and aligning with the wires on the recipient optic nerve if it was injured in a way where it will not function as a connecting conduit to the, to the vision center. So uh, it all depends on the nature of the, of the injury. I will, I will add to Dr. C's comments uh, because I like to challenge him all the time. We've worked together for over 30 years and uh, many of the discoveries and ideas we come up is from challenging each other. Uh, but I challenge Dr. C because I see this with an additional part to it. So even if the connection, those wires are damaged, if we can implant a Bluetooth transmitting chip in the retina of the transplanted eye and then implant a Bluetooth receiving chip in the brain of that same patient, we will be able to send that signal. And we may not necessarily have to look at the biology of that connection at that point. So we're going to explore uh, many ways to reconnect those images, like Dr. C said, from the television camera back to uh, where, where the image has to be received. So I'll challenge him with this. <laughs> well, well, both ideas accelerate research. Uh, so that's a that's a doable project. We can explore it. Well, you're all seeing this live. This is just happening now. So you heard the challenge. They heard the challenge was accepted. And I don't know where this hour has gone. I, I truly, truly don't. It has been uh, remarkable. Uh, Dr. Alfonso, before we go, we want to hear some final thoughts from you. But I have to ask you just from myself and, and listening to Dr. Palais and Dr. C and 
everything you've already done at Bascom Palmer, how exciting is this for you and your team at Bascom? And then your final thoughts, please. Well, Tony, I, I always tell every person that asks me about what's it so great about working at Bascom Palmer is that uh, on my way from home to here, uh, or as soon as I wake up, I feel I'm gonna be walking today into a candy store and I will have a very hard time picking what candy to eat today because this is what Bascom Palmer is, is the world's best candy store. And uh, there are so many incredible uh, patient treatments, uh, uh, research, education going on here that, uh, that it is really a, a one of a kind place. So uh, a very exciting place to be at. And, and uh, uh, I, I can tell you that the scientists uh, that are working here are so incisive and uh, everyone at the Bascom Palmer is uh, willing to participate mm -hmm. in, the, in the community of uh, creative thinking. Uh, and as you can see, the physicians here tonight and all of our physicians are amongst the best in the world and are committed to maintaining that level of uh, excellence. Uh, and uh, we are gonna get to that point of being able to achieve these breakthroughs like uh, transplanting an eye. And without philanthropy, we won't be able to do it. So we really have to engage our audience, uh, which has been so helpful to us in the past to go ahead and help us achieve this uh, incredible goal. It will be a one of a kind for humankind. Tony, I, I, may, I may add that Bascom Palmer is not just a hospital. It is an inspiration. Well, Dr. Palaj, we can't let you not say something here. So would you like to add to that before we close? I mean, uh, I'm obviously the more junior of the faculty here. I joined the faculty just seven years ago. And I, I can tell you that working amongst the best really elevates your level of thinking. Uh, what you just saw from Dr. Alfonso and Dr. C, I live every day, where they challenge us to think outside the box, to, to come up with these really, really top-notch goals of how to apply the latest and the greatest technologies. And like Dr. Alfonso said, I, I look forward to coming in every day and seeing what new discoveries and what new trials we can try to bring better healthcare to our patients. Thank you, Dr. Palais. I, I think all of you kicked the box out of your offices. I don't, I don't think there is a box anymore. Uh, we just want to thank everybody for participating in tonight's In the Know Town Hall. Uh, I don't know about all of you watching, but I lost count as to how many times I just kept saying, wow. I mean, truly. And, and off of the words of Dr. C, we have to believe in the impossible. This was truly an incredible hour and no pun intending. It was an eye-opening hour. I know for all of those who have been, you have been with us before, I, I seem to always say how blessed we are to have all of these amazing, passionate, intelligent, gifted doctors here at the University of Miami. But make no mistake about these brilliant minds that we had tonight. We are more than just blessed. We are incredibly blessed. And again, let's believe and let's dream in accomplishing the impossible. Please remember that a full recording of this program will be posted online. Look for the link in the coming days. And then in a moment, you're going to see a survey about tonight's town hall on your screen. Please just take a minute. In fact, it won't even take you that long to submit your feedback, because what this will help us do is understand your interest and it will help improve our program. As always, uh, it has been, again, an incredible hour. We wish you and your family good health. Stay healthy, stay safe, and remember, it is always about the you. Good night, everyone.